So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last official day of uh, our blog seminar. So today we'll have uh, five presentations plus uh, five uh, progress reports by uh, PhD students and also postdoctoral students. Uh, I have the privilege to be uh, the first presenter. Uh, so for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be talking about uh, infant and young child feeding in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the content of this presentation is directly taken from, uh, from one of our uh, recent publication uh, in BMJ Open. Uh, so this is as background information. Probably, as most of you know, in developing countries, uh, nearly half of uh, the total uh, mortality is directly attributable to malnutrition. But it would be wrong uh, if we only consider or if you only see malnutrition from a uh, child survival point of view, because malnutrition is uh, indispensable for the physical and mental development of children. Specifically, the first two years of age are very critical for many reasons, including the first one is malnutrition, which occurs in this period, is largely irreversible, both in terms of linear growth and also uh, cognitive def uh, deficiencies. And the complementary feeding period that typically ranges from two, 6 to 23 months of age is characterized by uh, growth retardation and onset of uh, micronutrient deficiencies. So this is kind of uh, old graph uh, which summarizes a study conducted by IFPRI. So we have the uh, weight for age of uh, under five children from three developing regions of the world. So if we see the pattern of African children at birth, their Z-score for weight for age is near to zero. But around the age of four, five, six months of age, there is rapid deterioration. Not only rapid deterioration, they fail to uh, capture or they fail to capture or uh, regain their uh, uh, lost uh, weight. So optimal infant and young child feeding has multiple dimensions, including timely initiation of breastfeeding, co uh, continuing exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months, introduction of uh, diverse complementary foods with adequate feeding frequency, and uh, continuing breastfeeding to two years of age. So in 2008, WHO proposed a set of core and optional indicators uh, which capture uh, these multiple dimensions of infant and young child feeding indicators. Uh, in line with these uh, WHO indicators, many surveys, uh, they have generated most of these indicators at national level or subnational level. However, pool, pooled indicators for the entire sub-Saharan Africa region, uh, they are not available. So that's why we conducted this study based on uh, multiple studies conducted across uh, the Africa region. So we conducted cross-sectional study based on 32 national surveys conducted in 32 different African countries between 2010 and 2016. Uh, so 32 out of 48 means nearly 85% of the African population is represented. Uh, in the analysis, children born in the previous two years of the survey, irrespective of being living or deceased or dead, uh, were included in the study. So this is the list of countries that we included in the analysis. Uh, so as you can see here, the sample size, the unweighted sample size ranges from 1,300 to 14,000 from uh, Comoros to Nigeria. And the weighted sample size that is corrected for the natural population size of the countries is uh, 33,000 for Nigeria and 144 for Comoros. So in total, the sample size of the study was 150,000 plus. Uh, so typically, uh, we use DHS surveys. Uh, DHS surveys, they are usually designed uh, to give a representative uh, figure at national level uh, and also place of residence, urban, rural, and also sub-national level like regions or uh, states. Uh, DHS, uh, it employs a multi-stage uh, cluster sampling approach. Uh, DHS, it collects data from the mothers of the index children using uh, a standardized and pre-tested questionnaire. Uh, um, 
the data, the quality is also assumed to be very good because the data collectors are extensively trained for at least uh, four weeks. In addition to the sociodemographic information, anthropometric and hemoglobin measurements are also made. Uh, so we employed uh, descriptive analysis with weighted uh, data analysis approach. Uh, so weighted means, for example, if we want to estimate a certain indicator for a given country, we use we employ sampling fraction. And if we want to make a kind of estimation for the entire sub-Saharan Africa, we use post-stratification weights. And to make sure that the weighted and unweighted samples are the same, uh, we employed normalization of weights. Finally, we generated uh, these eight four indicators and uh, six uh, optional indicators of infant and young child feeding. So the eight core indicators, the first one is early initiation of breastfeeding. That means initiating breast within the first one hour of birth. Exclusive breastfeeding, what proportion of the children uh, were only given breast milk among children zero to five months, were only given breast milk in the previous day of the survey. Continued breastfeeding at age one year is uh, calculated uh, based on the breast feeding pattern in this age group, 12 to 15 months of age. Introduction of uh, solid, semi-solid or soft foods means what proportion of infants, six to eight months of age, received food in the previous day of the survey. Uh, minimum dietary diversity, you know it. It's a proxy indicator for nutrient density. So out of the standard seven food groups, what proportion received from four groups, once again in the previous day. But sometimes children may consume very small amount of food, so relying on dietary diversity by itself may not be adequate. So we have to see another proxy indicator of the amount of food consumed. That is uh, the minimum meal frequency. So this is a proxy indicator for uh, the amount of food consumed. So uh, among children six to 23 months of age who received the minimum number of times, that is uh, minimum meal frequency. So children with optimal dietary diversity and meal frequency, they are assumed to have acceptable diet. So acceptable diet is a function of post-2. And the, the last core indicator is consumption of iron-rich or iron-fortified foods. That means uh, in the preceding day of the survey, if the child receives flesh foods or uh, fortified foods which are designed for children or foods which are designed at household level that means micro level fortification or point of use fortification then uh, the child would con would, would would satisfy this uh, indicator we also have six more uh, optional indicators relatively less important indicators including continued breastfeeding at two years between the age of 20 to 23 months and also predominant breastfeeding so when we say exclusive breastfeeding, only breast milk has to be given for zero to five months of eight children. But sometimes mothers may give water or other water-based liquids. Still, the child, if the child is taking water, for example, the child is not exclusively breastfed. That can be considered as predominantly breastfed. Uh, so um, when I come to the results, 70% uh, of uh, the respondents from rural areas were from the rural areas. 41% of the mothers were illiterates. Uh, in 15% of the cases, the data was about deceased or dead children. And if we see the age distribution, it's more or less uniformly distributed, except some underrepresentation in the age 18 to 23 months. So this shows a summary of nutritional status of, status of children in Africa. Uh, was thing 10%, more or less the same for many countries in Africa. Underweight, 22%, stunting, 24%. Uh, what is more surprising is the prevalence of anemia. So among children, 0 to 23 months in Africa, 3 in 4 are anemic. Uh, so uh, this is really a big figure. And why we have a uh, high prevalence of anemia, maybe one, the issue of nutrient density can be there. Dietary diversity is low. Consumption of iron-rich foods is also low. The other one is late initiation of complementary foods because breast milk is not very rich with iron. So if uh, initiation of complementary food is delayed beyond six months of age, there is uh, obvious risk of anemia. 
The third one is scientifically it is assumed, for example, if the mother has adequate iron store during pregnancy, she would give adequate liver store for the newborn uh, to cope with the low level of iron in breast milk for the first four to six months of age. But the problem is mothers themselves are anemic uh, and the coverage of iron supplementation during pregnancy is also low. Frequent infections may also con might also uh, contribute to this burden. So this is a summary of uh, all the core and optional indicators uh, of infant and young child feeding in Africa. Ever breastfeeding is almost universal, but timely initiation of breastfeeding is only half. Only half of the mothers in Africa initiate breastfeeding immediately after birth within the first one hour. If you see exclusive breastfeeding, we assume that in Africa breastfeeding is good, but the level of exclusive breastfeeding is as low as 40, 41%. Might be better than the other regions of the world, but it's not uh, up to the level. Uh, but predominant breastfeeding is 72%, relatively higher, which shows uh, in addition to breastfeeding in Africa, giving other water-based foods to uh, children in the first five months of age is very common. 90% of children, they continue breastfeeding to one year of age and nearly 50% to two years of age. So more of the problem is here. Minimum meal frequency, as I have already said, the proxy for amount of food given to the children is 42%. Dietary diversity is extremely low, 20%. And the function of these two is only 9.8%. Uh, plus uh, consumption of iron-rich or iron-fortified foods, only one third. Uh, usually in Africa, we assume breastfeeding is universal, so we don't give much attention to non-breastfed infant and young children. Uh, but if we see uh, how is uh, the, milk, the milk feeding frequency for non-breastfed children, only 15% of uh, one five of the children, they receive from two or more, uh, receive two or more uh, milk feeds uh, every day, which is a standard. Um, as I have already said, early initiation of breastfeeding, only 50% of mothers. Uh, they give breast milk in the first one hour of birth. If we see the extreme side, 12.5% initiate after the first day of birth. That means the child has to starve almost over a day without anything, without breast milk, without uh, anything. Uh, if we see country level values uh, or figures in Rwanda, Mozambique, Malawi, Burundi, Ethiopia, and Namibia, more than two thirds of the children, they initiate breastfeeding within one hour of birth, which is very good. And uh, conversely, in Congo, in Chad, it is less than uh, 25%. Exclusive breastfeeding, as I have already said, it is 41% among children less than six months of age. Specifically, if we see age group four to five months, it is as low as uh, a quarter, 24%. Um, in countries like Rwanda, Zambia, Lesotho, exclusive breastfeeding is very good, 70 plus. But for example, if you see Chad, only 0.3% of children, they are exclusively breastfed. In countries like Comoros, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, Nigeria, it is less than 20%. And if we rate these 32 countries included in the survey based on the WHO uh, guideline, 19% um, are less than 50%, that means either in the poor or fair category. So many countries in Central Africa or uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, the exclusive breastfeeding practice is less than 25%. Similarly, in countries like Ethiopia and other East African countries, uh, it is 50% plus. Introduction of complementary food. So the indicator, uh, we all know that uh, complementary food should be introduced at six months of age. But in terms of uh, indicator, it is calculated as among children six to eight months of age, what proportion received food yesterday. Uh, so the aggregate figure is 70%. Uh, and it is greater than 90, uh, uh, sorry, if it is greater, it's greater than 90% in Tanzania, Mozambique, Congo, Zimbabwe, and less than 50% Guinea, Liberia, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Uh, if you see this graph, the black line, it shows uh, children who receive solid, semi-solid, or soft foods. So at the age of six months, only 50% of the children received foods. 
And if we see at the age of 12 months, still 10% are yet to start food. Even at the age of 23 months, 5% they are yet to start food. They are still only dependent on breast milk. Um, adequacy of milk frequency, uh, I said 42%, uh, they receive from uh, they receive the minimum recommended frequency of uh, food. Country-wise, Gambia, Lesotho, Nigeria, and Niger, they are relatively better. Malawi, Mali, Angola is the opposite. Then when we come to dietary diversity score, uh, the mean dietary diversity is 2.3, and only 21% consumed from four or more food groups. And if we see the age uh, disaggregate figures, it is as low as 13% in children 6 to 11 months. Uh, so this is a graph which shows uh, the seven standard food groups and proportion of children uh, who receive from that specific food group. So consumption of uh, cereal staples is obviously common and vitamin E rich, and rich fruits and vegetables something like nearly half consumed. But consumption of egg, flesh foods, dairy products, legumes and other fruits and vegetables is low. Uh, so why, like consumption of other food crops apart from the, the cereal staples uh, is low? It may depend on uh, obviously availability and sometimes also some uh, knowledge uh, awareness factors can also be there. So this is another study taken from another study that we conducted in Sao Zolo, uh, one of the provinces in Ethiopia. So in this, in this, in this study, we try to compare the dietary diversity of children, which is indicated in the blue line, and the dietary diversity of their mothers, based on the same seven food groups recommended for children. So here, what we can see is uh, nearly all of the, ma uh, the mothers received from legumes and nuts, but that was not the, ca the case for their children. So it shows sometimes the, 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 the food groups might be there in the household, but may not be necessarily given to children due to some cultural misconceptions. And the same thing to also other foods and vegetables. Nearly 20% uh, of the mothers receive from other foods and vegetables, but only 5% for their uh, children. This is a dietary diversity uh, landscape. So as you can see here, many countries in Central and South, uh, sorry, Western, uh, uh, Africa, including Ethiopia and Uganda, they have very low uh, dietary diversity. Consumption of iron-rich foods, uh, only one third consumed of the children consumed iron-rich foods. And if we disaggregate this figure into two, 28% uh, took flesh foods and 94% consumed from iron-fortified foods. The lowest level of iron consumption or consumption of iron-rich foods is, is in Ethiopia, 12%. And the highest is in Gabon, nearly 75%. So as you can see here, uh, proportion of children 6 to 23 months of age who consumed iron-rich food in the preceding day of the survey is very low in Ethiopia, Niger, Burkina Faso, and uh, Burundi. Uh, for most of the... Uh, IYCF indicators, uh, substantial heterogeneity is there in Africa. Uh, but uh, regarding this acceptable diet, across all countries, the proportion of children who had acceptable diet in the previous days less than, consistently less than uh, 20%. Uh, uh, as I have already said, uh, if a child is not receiving breast milk, instead, uh, he should or she should take at least two milk feeds per day. Uh, but in the 20, uh, adequacy of milk feeding, uh, we only assess in 29 of the, the 32 countries due to some uh, differences in data collection. So among infant and young children, uh, young children who are not breastfed, only 15% they uh, took from the recommended two or more milk feedings. So this is a summary of uh, what I have already said. So this one, this one indicates exclusive breastfeeding. The blue one, exclusive breastfeeding plus some water-based uh, fluids. Uh, and the red one, uh, infant formula. And the central blue one, 
complementary food with breast milk and the red one complementary food without uh, breast milk. So as you can see here, there is huge discrepancy uh, between exclusive breastfeeding and predominant breastfeeding. So it shows maybe if we discourage provision of uh, water and water-based food, water-based fruits, uh, fruits to infant and young child, child uh, young children, we can uh, easily increase exclusive breastfeeding practice by 10 to 20 percent. And also, um, if we take proportion of children who are receiving complementary food plus breast milk and complementary feeding, uh, complementary foods alone. For example, at the age of six months, nearly 60, 40 percent, they are not start. They are not having complementary foods. Even at the age of 12 months, some 10 percent, they are yet to start complementary foods. So some strengths and limitations of the study are there. And at the end of the day, uh, 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 what you observe is most breastfeeding-related indicators are good in Sub-Saharan Africa, except exclusive breastfeeding and early initiation of uh, breastfeeding. Complementary feeding indicators are generally low. Uh, so uh, even though some heterogeneity is visible across countries, however, the minimum dietary diversity and acceptable diet indicators, they are consistently low uh, across the sub-Saharan African countries. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you have uh, any question to the presenter, <laughs> No problem. Yeah, yeah. I'll. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Samson, for a nice presentation and uh, very short, precise. Uh, my question it's not like a question, it is a curiosity thing. Uh, we know that uh, Ethiopians mostly eat uh, teff, so uh, it's a myth that teff has uh, more uh, iron or it's an uh, iron-rich food and uh, has been called superfood, of course, because of gluten-free and also other micro-minerals. And uh, we see from the figures that uh, Ethiopia as a country has uh, the lowest iron. Yeah, so... How can you see that? Uh, regarding iron, uh, uh, it's the nature of the indicator itself. Because when we say uh, consumption of iron-rich foods, we are accounting for three major sources. The first one is flesh food. The consumption of flesh foods, if flesh foods in Ethiopia is obviously low. The second one is consumption of uh, foods specifically designed for infant and young, ch uh, young children, and also fortified for iron. The coverage of fortification is also obviously low in Ethiopia. And the third one is micro-level fortification at household level, which is also at uh, rudimentary stage. So the indicator doesn't account uh, iron, which comes from the plant-based system. The reason is, uh, out of uh, the iron that we have in plant-based foods, we can only absorb 2 to 5%. Maximum, if there is, uh, for example, if we consume with vitamin C or some acidic foods, we may push the uh, bioavailability to 9 or 10%. So the iron is there, but the problem is with uh, the absorption. The absorption is uh, relative. That's why it's not accounted there. Yeah. Thank you uh, for the nice presentation. I've seen from your data that uh, Ethiopia is in a good class for exclusive breastfeeding. And this, I think, uh, currently encouraged. But on the other hand, the child strengthening is very high in Ethiopia. Yeah. This seems to me a paradox for me. That means in what ways has this exclusive breastfeeding helped yeah. our children? Thank you. Uh, the, the existing evidence shows uh, uh, we recommend exclusive breastfeeding for various reasons, including good immunity, reducing the risk of future infection. But uh, global data 
uh, doesn't show any association between exclusive breastfeeding and stunting. Exclusive breastfeeding, it may have its own so many benefits, but it's not a predictor of stunting. More of what is more important in terms of stunting is the quality of diet. Uh, specifically, they receive after the first, after the six months of age onwards. Uh, if we see the prevalence of stunting, for example, in Ethiopia, <coughs> in children zero to fifty-nine months of age, uh, the highest uh, rate is after the age of uh, six months onward. It shows the the suboptimal nature of uh, the complementary food is contributing to that burden. But, but as I have already said, exclusive breastfeeding has so many benefits, but in terms of stunting, there is no proven effect of exclusive breastfeeding on stunting. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Samson for a very brief and comprehensive presentation. Uh, I would like to know, uh, actually for curiosity, this is a huge data, and, and looking into the whole, almost whole Africa, uh, but uh, I didn't, probably I, I didn't follow you properly. How did you get this data? Is it a metadata that you got from literature, or is it uh, Actually, the first-hand data, primary data. So, if if if, the, if that is the case, I would like to know how this old data could be be able to generate it. And actually, I was expecting someone uh, to be with you to do this old job. Mm -hmm. And I would also probably on the acknowledgement or any anywhere you could have uh, said something about yeah. the organizations or yeah. who funded this yeah. big activity. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it, it is yeah. really yeah. undermining yeah. the work. Yeah. Uh, DHS survey it is uh, uh, DHS survey. They are conducted by major DHS and national agencies. For example, CSC in the case of Ethiopia. Uh, DHS uh, the data sets of all the countries it is available online. Uh, you need actually you need to have some very brief uh, concept note to have uh, access to the data. Uh, then uh, you can easily download. The advantage is the coding scheme of every survey is the same. So it's a matter of just three, four hours just to, do, to download the data of the entire Africa and merge it into one mega data set. It's not, re it's not really uh, such very difficult, but you said I have to acknowledge major DHS for granting access to the data. <laughs> Time to switch to the chairs and <laughs> from the present. So uh, let's go to the next presentation. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you for the chance. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself. Uh, I think you all know me. I'm Fakadu from Hausa University, uh, from the Academic Center of Excellence for Human Nutrition. And I would like to briefly uh, discuss with you about 
uh, research project which I'm uh, conducting, uh, which is on uh, progress in relation to my PhD. And it's focusing on linking agriculture development with education, health, and uh, nutrition outcomes. And uh, <coughs> uh, before I go there, I'll, I'll uh, briefly uh, tell you about the Academic Center of Excellence for Human Nutrition uh, at Haas University. So this is the organization where uh, I really take as my major, my major initiative in relation to my PhD degree. And uh, of course, some of the related uh, ideas together with the uh, Center of Excellence. So this Center of Excellence was founded before 10 years. And uh, it is the first institution that started human nutrition training in Ethiopia. And we are very happy that today nutrition is well known in the country. And a lot of uh, scholars and a lot of researchers are discussing nutrition today. Before a decade, there was no nutrition training institution in the country. And thanks to many partners that worked with us, now we did manage to have first degree, second degree, and PhD degree in human nutrition, not only in Hawassa, also in other institutions in the country. So this is the center of excellence. If you have been in Hawassa, uh, maybe you did pass by the, our laboratory. And uh, we dream to be a center of excellence, not only by name, but by delivering, by making the best research and quality evidences in the country. Uh, so we know our focus. I should acknowledge these five uh, scholars who were behind the words of nutrition in the country. Uh, and the leader is Dr. Eulso Abbebe, uh, who was the mother of nutrition training in Ethiopia, as far as I know. There might be other mothers. <laughs> and the other is Professor Rosalind Gibson from New Zealand, Professor Barbara Stoker from Oklahoma State. Of course, Suzanne, I see her name on the booklet of the first uh, Ethiopian embassy program, Need Assessment Report. And also Dr. Carol from Canada. Of course, there are many, but uh, these five people are the mothers for nutrition training there in Ethiopia. So where are we today? We have first degree in human nutrition and, and also in food science and post-harvest technology. We also have MSc in applied human nutrition, MSc in food science and technology. And the major one which is relevant for this audience is the PhD in human nutrition. And we have 60 PhD, 16 PhD candidates admitted there. And we are also going to start MSc in food safety and quality management, also PhD in food safety and quality, uh, food safety, uh, sorry, in food science and technology. So this is huge for Ethiopia. I know this in Ethiopia, in only in Hawassa University, if you go to many universities, we find a lot of new initiatives that require, that invite partners to work with us. So, uh, uh, yeah, these are opportunities, especially the PhD program. As you, you see from this Clifood uh, project also, it's a very good uh, to do high quality research. And we can also work together for PhD teaching, not only research, also teaching. Also PhD supervision, which is really a very challenging assignment for us. And also we can do joint experience sharing events like this one. And you are all invited for the coming conference in House University in April. And uh, we have a national conference where PhDs have the chance to talk to international audience. We also can work together in relation to online learning. I know this speech is being online transmitted. The same can be done for PhD classes. And we can scale up such, such projects, such initiatives so that in, uh, technology can assist us in accessing uh, knowledge and resources globally. In the meantime, also we can help each other in publication. One of my uh, staff members is struggling to publish his paper, for example, to know which journal is the correct journal? We have witnessed from experience there are some journals who just publish everything you send them. 
as far as you pay. So it's, it's just, uh, so it's, it's really very tricky. And also we cannot pay online because we don't have that uh, financial system. Of course, joint businesses can also emerge out of PhD research. And uh, I should also mention, now I'm going to discuss about myself. I know it's not common in a prof professional uh, discussion to, pr to present a picture of your family member. But my daughter, the little daughter, she said, if you talk about yourself, don't forget to say something about us. It's true. So I, I'm, I'm starting to use my picture, picture of my family, when I, I introduce about myself. But it's very much related to my PhD research also. I'm going to uh, <coughs> tell you more why I'm focusing on education and linking agriculture with nutrition as my major PhD research topic. This is my passion. It's a dream that I want to, I want to see in Ethiopia, that our children get the best food, also the best knowledge, not just food. We discuss a lot about stunting and the like, but physical size does not mean that thinking. So we need to measure both uh, physical size of our uh, young generation, also what they think and their cognition. That's uh, the uh, issue. And these uh, children, you can see the smile on their faces. And it's visible if this is their classroom. What should be then there is not that much. I don't need to write a text about it. And uh, <coughs> so, uh, so my, my motive to work on this project is that agriculture and health, as you have seen from all these different presentations, is the foundation for whatever we do. And education is, of course, is the tool that helps us to uh, empower the society. We, we are all born equal. We are created human beings, but we are recreated by education. If there is difference between us, it's the education, it's not by birth. The, the amount of education, the quality of education we, we attended made the difference. And uh, so it's very important to link agriculture, health, and education. And uh, it's very important for the country. Uh, there are no more research conducted in Ethiopian school education in general, especially in you know, school children and adolescents. Maybe you remember from this presentation during the Hidden Hunger presentation, adolescent girls and related studies are very rare globally. And it was one of the major research gaps uh, indicated. And the schools are actually the best place if we want to target school age children. It's not like other community members. They come to school every day, and it's a very manageable setting. It's not very challenging compared to the other the other uh, settings. So <coughs> uh, I just quoted a paper which was published uh, very recently where they say there is a huge data gap in relation to uh, adolescents and school age children. So and it's also a second window of opportunity. Where is the first window of opportunity? They say this is the second window, but where is the first window of opportunity? For addressing nutrition. I'm very sure you did hear from this hidden anger. When is the first window? 1,000 days, right? That's when growth is very sharp, fast. And then the next window is when? During adolescence end. Uh, so we need, to, we need to use that chance to catch up, especially some uh, uh, children who, ca who are stunted at birth might have a chance to, to catch up during adolescence. And uh, so, very obvious about Ethiopia, the key factors, we have about 109 million population, which is very huge opportunity. Big market for us. If we make a very good marketing and linkages within the country, it's a very uh, fertile ground to have a very good economy. For sure, Ethiopia was also one of the fastest growing economies 
uh, during the 2016 uh, assessment conducted by World Bank. Uh, of course, more than 75% of our population are depending on agriculture-related activities, and most of them rule, uh, live in rural areas. And so change in agriculture can impact a lot, not only on uh, uh, economy, also on nutrition. It's just evidence that all the stories we hear about Ethiopia are not sad stories. A lot of nice stories are there. The country is struggling. There are some uh, impacts also being made there. Uh, when we come to the agriculture sector, it's obvious this is the major dominant farming practice in the country. And uh, of course, there is a lot of problem in relation to post-harvest losses as it has been presented last time or very recently by the other presenters. And the market linkages are very weak. Maybe if you remember from Dr. Seifu's presentation, during the big hunger in Ethiopia, uh, which world uh, community know a lot, it doesn't mean that there was no food in the country. The major failure was the market linkages. And this is one area where I am very much interested in to explore relation to my PhD, uh, to bring or at least to consider school as one market for farmers. Because there are many, many advantages, and the market is actually very huge. The, in 2016, the Ethiopian school children data is about 37 million. Maybe this 37 million can be two European countries. Only the children or school community in Ethiopia, which is a big market. We already do school feeding for university and students. All public universities in Ethiopia, we have a school feeding. We have the experience. It's possible to feed if we really make the priority there. And uh, <coughs> of course, the education sector. The impact in relation to uh, nutrition and health is visible. Uh, of course, about half of our women are not educated. And the non-educated mothers have about 3.8 more children compared to those who are educated at secondary school level. And if you see women with no education, they marry about seven years earlier than the educated mothers. Because they don't go to school, and the only option they have is to get married as early as possible. And uh, of course, these are the leaders of tomorrow, school children. And uh, they are our soldiers <laughs> that we are going to use to defeat poverty in the country. So they need to be trained, both mentally and physically. We should not ignore school children, and uh, especially in a country like Ethiopia, where a lot of homework is left for the future generation. So we need to make the, the foundation about how to uh, tackle this problem. About the hidden anger, I just take one. Only iron deficiency anemia. You can see about 70% of children are already anemic. And those, from, uh, those whose mothers have no education are about, um, sorry, anemia is more common in children from the poorest households and from those who are not Mothers are not educated. So the power of education behind the nutrition is big, actually. Not just food, but the, the, the feeding. And when you come to the dropout from schools, only 10% of Ethiopian children reach to grade 12. The amount of children we have in grade 1, and the final uh, students that we see in grade 12, a lot of them stay behind for different reasons. Of course, they also fail exams because the country cannot accept all of them to come to university level. Some of them, they go for diploma, others they go for technique training and the like, others they... Uh, <coughs> so it's a, it's a huge problem for Ministry of Education. Minimizing these dropouts is one of the major targets for Ministry of Education. And school feeding have been documented to bring more students to school. 
there is uh, evidences uh, generated in the country. Uh, it's visible also, even if students are going to school, their academic performance is very, very bad, even by Ethiopian standards. And uh, so why school? School quality in general, not only feeding, even the, the, the setting of schools in most places are not good. So I want, I want uh, in my study, the education sector to be given attention. Because a lot of gaps are there. And I was motivated to do, okay, why not I take education as, as my, my target? And uh, <coughs> when we come to school feeding, maybe you did hear about homegrown school feeding program. This is uh, one of the major development interventions which the Ethiopian government is implementing. Initially, it was uh, through imported school from abroad, uh, imported food. Now it's homegrown, which means all the food we use for feeding should be produced in country from local settings. And there are also, if you see globally, there are about 368 million children which are breast, uh, being uh, given food from schools. And it's not only in poor countries, even Germany, USA, all the rich countries also have a school feeding programs. So it's not only Ethiopia, it's very common. And the amount of money or finance within the school feeding is about 75 billion USD per year, globally. And uh, major leads then to address education, health, agriculture, also to bring together family members, especially in Western communities. And uh, school feeding is also common in Ethiopia, even during the King Ayla Selassie time, even if it's not that scientifically published and the like. That's a story we hear from grandparents and the like. There were feeding programs ongoing. So in Ethiopia, school feeding was started in 1994 in four regions, uh, Amhara, Oromia, Afar, and Tigray. And it was at meant to given for the poorest families as a safety net. The aim was not to improve education, I mean to food security, rather to bring students to school where there is disaster and the like when children are not coming to school uh, for different reasons. So feeding is primary then to, uh, for education of food insecure households to improve agriculture development and also to improve health and nutrition. So from the aim, you can see which ministries are interested. When it's agriculture development, it's Ministry of Agriculture. Education is for Ministry of Education. Nutrition and Health is Ministry of Health relation to school. So it's uh, a very good topic that bring different sectors together. So uh, progress of feeding in Ethiopia. By now, Ethiopian government did already allocate about 10 million USD for school feeding. There is already uh, very good uh, ongoing uh, activities there. And uh, national school feeding strategy have been developed. And of course, Within the f new Ethiopian food and nutrition policy, school feeding is mentioned as one major strategy for education sector. And the uh, SNNPR is taken as a model so far. The strong school feeding program is within the south uh, parts in the country. And what are the major gaps? This is the beginning of my research question. That so far, we use cereals, pulses, vegetable oil, and iodine salt as a major feeding ingredients. But sustainability of the feeding program is a bit uh, questionable because it's majorly done for emergency, which means if there is no emergency, school feeding might stop. That's number one. And homegrown school feeding assumed to benefit farmers, but we don't know how much benefit farmers are getting from school feeding. What did it help them? What's the benefit for the agriculture sector? Also, urban children are not included. There are a lot of poor families in urban area, but the school feeding didn't address the urban uh, pro uh, so poor societies also. Impact on nutrition and education is very limited study. There are many uh, new initiatives, but still there are questions to be answered. How much it helps for uh, 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 nutrition? Uh, 
the, I mean, the for health and also the ways to include fruits, vegetables, animal source. This is one other major question for me. Why not we use milk or egg or maybe carrots in relation to school feeding? Why we focus only on these cereals? Of course, operation-wise, these are easier. They're easy to store, easy to transport, but it does not mean they are the best for uh, supporting agriculture also to help the students have the best out of the school feeding. Also food safety issues, water and sanitation, these are one of the major gaps observed so far. Most Ethiopian schools don't have very good water system and it affected the school feeding system. And also, of course, as I said above, the, the use of animal and fruit sources. So, so malnutrition impacts both physical and cognitive development. And quality education and quality feeding, these are the two answers. And uh, we also uh, have a very good aspect from uh, social aspect. If school feeding is implemented, if families involve, especially in urban areas where people are rushing for daily life, then school feeding can be a chance to bring family members together, to discuss about their children, to cook food together, to eat and you know, to socialize together. And it's both for, for uh, rich and poor families. It should not be only safety net. So these are the research questions. As I said, my major research question is how can we supply uh, school feeding through cooperatives and small and medium enterprises? This is a study about the farm side of school feeding. And also, what are the potential opportunities and challenges to include animal source foods, fruits and vegetables in feeding program? I want to do cost benefit kind of study also how can we enrich the menu? And the other question is how much Im impact can we bring in relation to health and nutrition? I use anthropometry and micronutrient uh, kind of indicators, also cognition. And the other is what are the ways to improve water and health sanitation? This is not uh, that much for research purpose, but this is an oper operational bottleneck. When there is no water, already I did make some qualitative research, and water availability is a big challenge. Whenever we discuss food, we usually forget to mention water. And they told me when they bring food for school feeding, usually children were looking for water, not for food because they're very thirsty. And um, so the method I use, I plan to go to four regions. Of course, I use Oromia and uh, South, the nearer, near villages as an intervention. And then I use a control, maybe in Amhara and in Tigray. And uh, the study population, we plan to include about 3,200 children and about 400 farmers to see the agriculture side of school food. And we plan to do longitudinal data three times, uh, I mean every three months per year for academic year. A one year uh, follow-up study will be conducted. I will also have some qualitative research and also survey, anthropometry uh, and income-related studies for farmers and cooperatives. I also plan to take some bi biochemical uh, data and food safety and aflatoxin related studies. I might not do all of them. The reason I started by discussing about how the university and the PhD program, I should not do all the research questions by my own. I might take one or two of the research questions and the other students who don't have grant or the like can work with me. I know most of the, our PhD students struggle to get research funding. And I already managed to get some seed money. So there is a possibility to make a kind of team. So the intervention is I use uh, as a control schools where there is no school feeding and schools with the standard feeding and schools using milk and vegetable as a feeding. And these are used then by private uh, sectors. Like you might have heard about uh, Freyalem Shibaba. He is a very nice person who is working on education sector. 
to feed children's milk. And they already have a very good story there. Also, the former uh, first lady of Ethiopia, she has a school feeding program in uh, Addis Ababa. We want to learn from that project. And also, there is another project in South Ethiopia called Abenezer School Feeding. They use vegetables as a major school feeding ingredients. So we want, we don't want, I don't have the resources to feed all these children if I buy the foods by my own. So I have to depend on already ongoing programs. Of course, for the government, this is very important. And how to enrich and bring in knowledge from the others, especially using milk and other nutrient-dense foods is uh, very much needed. So what's the progress so far? I'm finishing. Uh, well, I did qualitative study uh, to understand the, the problem. What is practically happening? So feeding was initially done through imported. It's World Food Program that started the school feeding in Ethiopia. They used to bring food from US, from Canada, and from Europe also. But that ended up being very expensive. And now they want the Ethiopian government to take over, and it was named Homegrown School Feeding Program. And value chains and capacity of cooperatives is not well studied because cooperatives are the major uh, supply side actors who bring all this food to the schools in the country. And there are more than 40 unions included already, and the capacity of unions have been changed a lot. There is a very huge market advantage that I did identify. And also animal source foods and the like are not that much studied, but it's a priority for Ministry of Agriculture. Ministry of Agriculture don't have big problem in relation to marketing and value chains of cereals. Rather, they want animals, especially fruits and vegetables, to be included, based on my discussion conducted by together with the Ministry of Agriculture. And impact on education is key priority for Ministry of Education. So we cannot ignore the education aspect of school feeding. And healthy nutrition is the focus for Ministry of Health. And uh, jobs for women, this was what was identified during my interview. A lot of women are getting jobs, working for feeding program, they cooking food for children and the like. And kitchen facilities, water, procur procurement process, quality control, these are not well studied. It's a big program, feeding, uh, like millions of children is not uh, less than teaching them. It's a lot of work, so it needs a lot of a lot of investment, a lot of training and the like. Huh? So this is like the number of schools included in homegrown school feeding program. You can see this is from the Ministry of Education, the latest data. Uh, about one million children are already included, and the cost expected is about 289 million. And the Ethiopian government did already approve this one. And it's majorly implemented for uh, safety, uh, emergency feeding when there is food security problem. So uh, who is involved? Cooperative unions as a supply, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Agriculture. The lead is Ministry of Education. World Food and FAO and other partners are supporting in terms of technique and uh, finance. Awasa University was part of this uh, school feeding program for a long time. We have been helping them in uh, especially designing the Ethiopian school feeding strategy. And uh, food industries are supplying already vegetable oil and iodine salt being supported, I mean supplied by Ethiopian uh, industries and the like. And the school administration and local uh, offices are also have a stake on it. So these are the cooperative unions who are uh, like being benefiting from the school feeding program market opportunity. We have about 40 cooperative unions. Of those, we have about 18 from Oromia, 16 from South, and five from Amhara. Uh, and uh, you can also see how many members of uh, farmers are there is in the cooperatives. There are about one million. Uh, I just have their data. If needed, you can uh, have a look at this. So what's done so far in relation to this project? We know the context of school feeding in the country. And also, we did qualitative study. And we are already uh, working on collaborations and partners. We did secure seed money. 
to conduct the basic activities. And two MSc students are already working on it. And another PhD student who is funded by Hawassa University, she is already uh, kind of uh, writing her manuscript. And uh, Dr. Samson is her supervisor. And she, already, she is trying to see impact of feeding on education only. And the value added, especially the major gap we have observed, is that the supply side of school feeding and how to enrich school feeding is not studied. Didn't get attention from the research community. So uh, my major research questions, I did say it again. Uh, it's the first is the supply side of school feeding, enriching school feeding, and also cooperatives. And uh, uh, if we see any correlation between stunting and cognition, our shortest children are actually poor in, the, in their cognition. This is a question. We are promoting a lot stunting reduction and the like. But what is happening in, the, in relation to cognition? And uh, of, of course, cooperatives are my uh, other focus area. And the way forward, I want to enrich the baseline and also improve the design of this study. It's not easy to do research in four regions. And uh, I'm still seeking further collaboration. I would do some PhD courses in Hawassa University. Of course, I'm a major advocate for WASH. At this level, I don't need to wait until I publish my PhD paper to start to promote about water availability in Ethiopian schools. We already see there is no water. Children are very thirsty. Not hungry, they just need water to drink at this level. And this is the beginning, I mean, like uh, my major finding at this stage. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And your questions and comments are welcome. That's uh, Thank you very much, Fakaru, for this uh, inspiring talk. In the interest of time, I have to limit uh, to two major questions. One, Dr. Tasfais, and Fasil. Uh, thank you very much, Fakaru, for your nice presentation. I would like also to thank Dr. Samson for his uh, nice presentation as well. My question is more general and uh, deals with the methodologies that you are using. When you talk of the sensitive age for child growth and development, you talked about 1,000 days windows. Mm. And Dr. Samson's presentation, it was, uh, I think, 24 months. So 1,000 days is about 33 months and 24 months. In other presentation, we listen to 60 months or five years. I don't know, under what scenarios do you use these three di distinct time regions? And what is, for, for me, uh, as a layman, which one is the most sensitive age for for as our formative period for the development and growth of a child. I think maybe you can was reflect on that. Dr. Sam, you can help me. Uh, the best window of opportunity is the 1,000 days, starting from the time of uh, conception, when the child is uh, conceived, until the child is two years old. But we need to kind of also understand these are a kind of just agreements by, by researchers. Does not mean that the time after two years is just time, let's say three years is not that much important. But uh, physiologically, especially within the mother's uh, uh, womb, it's the time when the child is growing very fast. And it's the time when most of the, especially brain related developments are uh, predetermined. So um, uh, the first two, uh, years together with the nine months of pregnancy, the time of fastest physiological development in terms of growth, for example. Uh, also, it's a very sensitive stage. A single mistake can damage the whole future of the child, especially folate deficiency, for example. If the mother didn't take folate supplementation, I think before she is pregnant, if she's already having folate deficiency when she is having a, a baby, getting pregnant, then it, it's not reversible. Child would already develop the spinal uh, kind of deformation and the like. So it's, uh, 
I think Dr. Sami Kanad is there. So, but then after childhood, time is a kind of ending. Grows, tend to grow, especially during adolescence. Those kids that we think are short might grow faster and become uh, taller. That's why it's taken a second window of opportunity, but it cannot replace the first window. The early, uh, the early 1,000 days until even five years should be the major focus, but there is another opportunity, especially if we want to also impact on their attitude and on their, they say, you know, the child uh, personality is shaped until seven years. And so education is very, very, very important. They you know the not only physical growth, but the other learning and cognition. Sami, so help me. I think uh, everything uh, you have this, uh, you have uh, responded correctly. Uh, the first one thousand days is obviously the best one. Uh, we consider uh, adolescence as the second opportunity in terms of linear growth. We can capture the lost uh, linear growth potential, but the problem with the second opportunity that is adolescence is. Uh, will not be able to capture the lost cognitive potential. So the first uh, 1,000 days is the best uh, opportunity to address both gross potential and also uh, cognitive development potential. Okay, th uh, thank you, Ficado, for your presentation. I, my, my question is also on the methodology part. Uh, you said you, you will be using panel data. And you said every three months is per one year. Before I ask my question, I have to, I have to be sure. Is this every three months in one year so that you will have four, four, four waves? Yeah, one academic year. In one academic year, you will have four rounds. Uh, there are some operation issues because I don't give the food by my own. Uh. Uh, this follows the government feeding program. The time of uh, start and ending might vary depending on the feeding intervention available, but for sure we have 10 months schooling time from September until June. Okay. Considering like the breaks time and the like so. But every three months I plan to repeat the study. Yeah, okay, now I can ask my yeah. question. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, the measures that you will use for cognitive development, for example, the, it could be the math score or the Peabody pixel, uh, any co um, psychometric measure that you will use. And you are going to collect data on, on children every three months. Do you think that the outcomes of cognitive development will be realized every three months? Yeah, the major interest here is the change in nutritional status. Cognition is just an additional, an additional uh, study. It's not the major, the major research question. But the thing is, we don't stop just only by looking at physical size of the children. They are in the school, and they are there to learn, to reason. And there are tools from uh, Oklahoma State University. We have a standard cognitive test tools, which even don't require a person to be educated. An educated person can also be measured in terms of cognition and reasoning. And uh, I didn't go to the details because I don't want to take your time. I'm also not done in relation to my planning. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, but yeah. The, sc the school feeding program is not all only about uh, about nutrition. It's yeah. all about uh, mostly it's about cognitive development. Yes. It's about improving the cognitive development of children who are deprived of food. Yes, right. So, uh, don't you think that it's important to incorporate the, the component of cognitive development in your research? Yeah, as I said, didn't I write it here? We, we do have cognition element in this study, but we don't expect also within one year, the cognitive uh, performance of the child will change that much. But like the, the other nutrition status indicators such as wasting, for example, weight gain, it can change in 10 months. But the cognition, rather it will, will take a one-time survey to see where are these children, relation to the cognitive level, and how much that correlates with their physical size. Like, the, do short children means, let's say, legs in relation to their cognition? And uh, maybe we, we uh, for sure, when this study is further developed, we'll have more 
But as I said, the cognition element is not the major, the major element of my, my Thank you, uh, Ricardo, for this inspiring talk again. Okay. So let's give him a round of applause. Uh, so now we'll have.